Hello and welcome to another video back onto the Powered Armoured Exoskeleton and now we've finally completed some armour testing in the previous videos it's finally time to lay the armour into the armour casing. In this video though I'm also going to be going over why I'm trying to make the M4 Sherman tank of suits of power armour over making say a King Tiger. But first let's go over how we're going to lay this armour into them casings. Now for anyone new to the channel, the composition of this armour is to have 3D prints with ceramic laid into the back of them and then some form of backing plate made out of a material to stop the shrapnel from getting through after it's passed through any ceramic. This is something we've tested in previous videos, it's proved to work with the right materials in mind and in this video we're really focusing on laying that ceramic. Now my original intention with this was to actually make my own porcelain ceramic, a high quality natural ceramic that does work and it's something that we could produce in the UK, my country of origin. My intention was to 3D print moulds like this one you see here, make most of it out of hexagons which is naturally the best shape for this type of thing and naturally a good shape to go around curves. And it could also mean that I could print specific pieces for the perimeter of the armour so that there'd be no gaps and it would all fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. With this idea I have done some experiments with making these tiles so I've got plenty of hexagonal tiles you can see here all custom size custom thicknesses they've even got a chamfer on so that when you put them together they can either form a curve or you can switch them around and they'll go flat in the middle. However the problems I had with these pieces is simply that I can't get them kiln fired. I can't get them vitrified, I can't get them hardened. The services around me, they either frankly are lazy and can't be bothered, or the ones that are actually professional are booked up six to eight weeks, meaning I can't even pay for kiln fires. And that is for firing something the size of a vase, not multiple square meters of these many hexagonal tiles and other pieces that are custom made. And the price of a kiln, unfortunately, for doing ceramics to porcelain temperatures are looking at about four or five grand. So at this moment I'm unable to buy it so I'm having to use some regular ceramic tiles that I can buy from stores that are high quality, made in the UK. But that does mean I'm having to cut them up by hand and fit them into the armour. This will still work, I have proven that in previous videos. It's just unfortunately not going to look perfect. So we'll be cutting up these tiles that we've previously tested and laying them into those 3D prints. This isn't too much of a disaster though due to how I've designed the suit to be. And this is where we get into how I've more tried to design this suit like the M4 Sherman tank was made, not like how the King Tiger was made. So, what were some fantastic things about the M4 Sherman design? Well, there was many, but the main one I want to focus on is how easily this thing could be manufactured from many different factories using different methods. The fact that you could have this tank design made with different engines, different guns, different suspension systems, and yet still work all from that original design. This is a type of thinking I've tried to include in my power armour design. For example, with the armour on the M4 Sherman, you could both make it in cast steel and in welded steel. This was incredibly valuable because while the casting was actually better for the armour, the castings for such a large thing were incredibly complicated to make and required a high amount of skill and a certain amount of resources in the factories. Whereas the welded armour was much easier to produce, allowing it to be produced in much larger numbers. With the armour on my suit, I've got it all set into these 3D prints, which enables a couple of things. One, these can be changed and upgraded very easily. They can also be lengthened and smallened depending on who is wearing the armour. And because it's all a part of regular CAD files, any new technologies that come around that either make the printing better, perhaps make, say, titanium 3D printing easier and cheaper, then those methods can be applied to the same design. And it wasn't just different construction methods that the Sherman design allowed. It was also the fitting of radically different parts, such as the heart of the vehicle, the engine. This included going from aero engines such as the right radial nine cylinder, as well as the General Motors twin six cylinder. And then onto the Ford GAA V8, which was actually an aero engine that was originally a V12, had four cylinders knocked off and turned into a V8. And even onto the Chrysler Multibank, which was a very strange setup of five six cylinder engines all kind of bolted together into one. The ability to fit all of these different types of engines into the same design meant that they were never without an engine to fit into the Shermans they were able to produce. 
This ability to use different types of propulsion is something I've tried to include in my power armor design, namely with the actuators on the exoskeleton. These are actuators of my own design, these being mock-ups currently working on a design that I can produce myself in the United Kingdom. But these are quite big actuators, which makes it much easier to make because there's less small tolerance parts to be made. It also means they can be replaced with different types of actuators quite easily because there isn't restrictions on size or as much as. So while these are going to be electronic actuators, in the future there could be versions that either have hydraulic actuators or pneumatic actuators fitted. And while there would have to be of a rotary design, there's plenty of space to do that. And there's plenty of room for pipes and wires to be laced behind the armor into the power pack, which is in the backpack. This is also something that's going to be interchangeable on my design. That way you can either fit more batteries to it, less batteries to it, or you can have a compressor fitted if you were doing pneumatics, or you can have a little generator to aid powering the suit by batteries in a hybrid design thereby allowing for maximum amount of different parts to be used from different manufacturers using different materials. Another impressive design feature of the Sherman tank, in my opinion, is the suspension. Not only was it much easier to maintain because you could just lift the bogies on and off, making it much easier to replace damaged parts or just replace parts for maintenance, but the fact that there were two different versions of this, one called VVSS and one called HVSS. The difference in these is one absorbs the shock vertically and one absorbs the shock horizontally. This might seem like a minor difference and it kind of is on the Sherman, but if you imagine having a car where you have the shock absorber vertical or then have it say horizontally like an F1 car, there normally would be a massive difference in fitting those two different parts. But on Shermans, it's just a bolt on bolt off deal. My version of this on the power armor design is really in the soles of the boots, I mean. So I've tried to keep these boots fairly modular so that parts can be replaced, upgraded, depending on what is required. So underneath the sole, which is custom made, can be bolted on and off with different methods of shock absorption. For example, this is quite a rigid version. It works quite well, however, it is quite loud. So I'm actually gonna be working on a more silent version made primarily out of EVA foam with resin coated over the top of it to make a boot tread. That'll be quieter, but not as resilient as this version. But at the same time, this could be unbolted and have a bigger tread fitted. For example, if you are planning to use the suit in say snowy conditions and you want from some form of snow boot on it, you could actually just bolt a snow boot onto the bottom of here instead of relying on a clip on variant. So what about comparing the Sherman design to the King Tiger? Well, I actually think the design of the King Tiger gets a bit of a bad rap these days because of how much of a waste of resources we know it was for Germany. But I actually think design overall was pretty good. You had that phenomenally powerful 88mm high velocity gun. You had a well-shaped and designed turret. You also had well-sloped tank armour to increase protection. And you also had a very effective suspension system that improved off-road mobility. However, the thing was monumentally expensive to produce because of its complexity. So if we take the suspension design, while it was actually improved from the Tiger 1, it was still incredibly hard to maintain because of the overlapping road wheels on the side. You had to take multiple off just to repair one of the back wheels. You couldn't just take off a bogey like you could on the Sherman. The armor provided excellent protection, obviously much better than the Sherman, but that did come with the cost of a massive amount of weight, meaning this thing weighed around 70 tons. Meaning that when it broke down, it was very hard to recover because you had to have an equally large vehicle, or equally as powerful at least. And break down it did. The only engine that the Germans had to offer it was the Maybach HL 230. A very powerful engine and quite impressive to be honest, but it was very complex and again expensive to make. And because it required such a big engine, it's not like you could swap it out easily for other ones. And then with that lack of reliability in mind and how hard to maintain it was, you then have to go back to the main features that it had that were good, like the high velocity gun. This on the Western Front was largely unnecessary, both because of the terrain it was fighting in and the armor it was facing. And then when it comes to the armor, the frontal armor was of course fantastic, but there's always gonna be weak points on tanks. And when it breaks down so much, and is such a lumbering behemoth, 
the enemy can always find a way around it and get to the weak points. And that's if the crew didn't have to scuttle the tank themselves after it broke down. All of this while it costing a monumental amount of money to produce. Meaning that all of those decent design features were basically wasted as it wasn't easy enough to use, operate and maintain. This is something that I've tried to avoid at all costs with my design of power armor. For example, one of the reasons I'm actually going with electronic actuators is I think they're easier to use, easier to maintain and easier to replace than say pneumatics, which are probably more powerful. As an ex-truck mechanic, all I think when I hear pneumatics is air leaks from push fit connectors. But nevertheless, I am aware that I don't really have the money to use the absolute best of everything for this prototype, for this design. But if I do the design right, then in the future when I have more money, I can always upgrade parts with either an updated design that can still be fitted to the old design or with just better materials. But either way, it will always remain easy to maintain and reliable in simplicity of the design. With that said, we'll get back to actually building the armor in this video and see how much we can get done. And we are going to start off with the chest and the forearms in this video. The chest plate, I've just added some carbon fiber to the back of it to make sure it's stiff enough for the ceramic. And then on the forearms, we're going to fit some nut inserts for the attachment points for the wrist extensions. And I'm just heating these T-nuts up, putting them on a bolt and then sticking them and setting them into the holes. Got all of these mounted in and you can see them poking out the other side. I just need to cover the holes up on the inside so I can lay some carbon fiber over the top without the resin going into the threads. Like this one that I prepared earlier. So you can see I've just used some tape over the top of them. I could 3D print some circles or something, but I, well, I couldn't be bothered. So this'll do. The two main reasons for carbon fibering over the top of the T-nuts is one, so they don't come loose and spin, and two, so if there's any pulling action on the wrist extensions, on the fist extensions, then it can't pull the T-nuts out of the armor. And then onto cutting and shaping the ceramic. Pretty easy to do, to be honest, it's just a bit time consuming, hence why I wanted to use the 3D printer custom ones. But nevertheless, it is doable and it does work fine. Although, as you can see here, the dust does get horrendous. And there we have the first of two layers of ceramic laid into the chest piece and the two forearms. They have gone in pretty good. There is a ridge line on the chest which is going to have to have extra layers on just to make sure there's full coverage at that crucial point. But nevertheless, it is time to take them out and start laying them into the resin of which we have this polyurethane resin that we tested last time, which is a semi-soft rubbery resin that did help hold all the tiles in place and together, even after they'd been hit, like we saw in the previous video. You can see at least because I tried to design the armor to really only be made out of one dimensional curves, how even these bigger, longer pieces do fit in pretty well. And once they are cut, it is actually quite quick to put together. And then when I went over the top of them with resin, trying to get into all the gaps, I did make sure that I pushed that's all of that ceramic together, making sure that there were no gaps and cracks between it, or as little as possible. Due to this resin going off pretty damn quickly, I did choose to just do one layer at a time and let it set in between. Because it's a soft resin, it will adhere pretty well to the next layer and everything. And as you can see with the chest plate, I am using quite a lot of resin, a few hundred grams at a time so I didn't want it to get too hot if I ended up doing multiple layers at the same time. Ooh, one thing that's worth mentioning about using these bigger tiles and just having to cut them up is that when these bigger tiles get hit, the damage does tend to spread further along these tiles, something that was limited when using these smaller hexagonal tiles as you would typically only damage one to three tiles, thereby creating more localized damage rather than risking it spread throughout the entire armor plate. Not ideal, but with what I said earlier, it's kind of just what it is. Now, I will be trying to overlap all of these tiles as much as possible. The only thing is, if I try to do like a 50% overlap of each tile, what you end up with is a big void between the two tiles where they bridge over from each other. So I'll be packing them as tight as possible, but and then allowing the curve of the armor to actually create the overlap for me. That way, there won't be any unwanted voids. Also, I will be making sure that all of these tiles are well glued together and basically all of the outline of it is well glued together as well. 
and packed out so there's no play in it. Plus, I'm pretty much settled on having a 1mm steel backing plate on the back of this bonded to the ceramic. So once that is securely fastened in place, then there'll be nowhere for any of these ceramic tiles to go, meaning providing that all of these tiles are pushed up neatly together, there shouldn't be much of a weak spot for anything to come through. And there we have it. We've got the chest piece done here, built together, and it does fit pretty well. We've got the ceramic laid in the back. It's also not too heavy. Of course, there's still the steel plates to line in the inside, and then we'll have an extra plate that goes on the inside of here for added protection. That will also help to make sure that there's overlapping pieces covered. There'll also be an extra overlapping piece to put in here just to make sure this ridge line is fully covered as well. And then we've got those four arm pieces complete. Both of them have come out pretty well with a rubbery finish on the inside. With those nut inserts showing just nicely should make for good attachment points. You can also see when it's over the forearm like so, if you imagine you've got your arm up like that, you'll actually have an increased amount of ceramic at certain angles. For example, if a round came into here at that diagonal an angle, you're going to have a lot more than 14 millimeters of ceramic. You're more likely going to have over an inch of ceramic with that angle of the armor. In the next videos, we'll keep laying this ceramic into the rest of the armor pieces for the suit. I'll also be getting the CAD files done so I can get these steel pieces plasma cut out and also fastened in to complete the armor. And then they'll just be the electronics to fit and we'll have a fully working functional suit of powered armor. So with that said, please like, subscribe. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you in the next one. And last of all, have a great day.